I do want to thank the organizers of this extraordinary conference. It's been wonderful. Thank you for, to the Cotter Foundation, Cotter Debate, and all of the affiliate organizations. Of course, David Williams is here with us today, who is specifically organizing and coordinating our argument in English sessions. Thank you, David. Um, the possibility for a global spread of argumentation and debate is the hope of this conference, and indeed, it's a significant development, I believe, in the history of nations. But in the midst of, and in the midst of intractable, and at times it seems impossible, differences in ethnic, national, and religious cultures, we rightly pursue the process of deliberation that encourages judgment and reason. However, we also should question if argumentation and debate are the ideal processes for navigating and negotiating difference. Now, I don't mean this in a narrowly pragmatic or utilitarian sense. I'm not asking if decisions made through argumentation are more effectively navigated than through other means. I'm asking the question about argumentation debate in a broader ethical sense. Are argumentation and debate ethically desirable? Are they morally right to pursue our different, the negotiation and navigation of differences? To put it more bluntly or sharply, are we being tricked by the promotion of argumentation and debate as a key to a better world? Does that translate? Are we being tricked or duped? Is argumentation actually a means for a stronger society? Or is it culturally limited? Or even a culturally transgressive practice? Are we morally right to uphold debate as a desirable means for navigating political, social, religious difference? Now, these are hard questions. I don't presume I have answers. But I want to press the question and explore a direction for an answer, and of course I will argue that I, th that I think there is a direction, but I, it is an argument. I presume you'll disagree. <laughs> I will affirm that argumentation and debate are ethically desirable, yet I will do so in ways different than the more common justification for these practices. I claim that our accepted rationale for the ethics of argumentation and debate in the Western world that this rationale is flawed and that if we promote argumentation and debate on the grounds of this flawed Western philosophical tradition, that it actually is contrary to the affirmation of political, cultural, and religious difference. So if we are going to promote argumentation and debate for a better world, we must repair the rationale or justification for argumentation and debate. So that's what I hope to do today. First, I will quickly uh, overview the shift that we need to make in our sense of argumentation. I will look at the Western philosophical tradition uh, and cri criticize that, and then sh suggest that we look to the Western rhetorical tradition, which I believe has also been incorporated and appropriated by even Arab cultures. And we're going to look to the Greek educator Isocrates of the fourth century BCE. And I think we will find an alternative conception of ethical argumentation than we find in the Western philosophical tradition. Indeed, specifically, Isocrates' concept of timely argumentation or timeliness is an ethical concept that shifts our focus in argumentation such that it promotes difference rather than reduces difference. In other words, I think Isocrates' view of argumentation and his view of timeliness actually leads to a practice of argumentation that honors and respects the differences within and across cultures. First, I want to talk briefly about uh, criticism of the Western philosophical rationale 
for the study of argumentation and debate. And I am going to rely on one voice for that criticism. Emmanuel Levinas is a 20th century French philosopher, and he criticizes on a whole scale, a grand scale, the Western philosophical tradition. And here is a core of his critical insight. I quote from him. This is Emmanuel Levinas. The history of philosophy can be interpreted as, as an attempt at universal synthesis, a reduction of all experience, of all that is reasonable, to a totality wherein consciousness embraces the world, end quote. Did you hear the language there? In Levinas's criticism of the Western philosophical tradition, it is rooted in synthesis, reduction, totality, embracing the world. The philosophical quest, according to Emmanuel Levinas, seeks to gather together the particulars and structure them into an overall synthesis. This is a totalization process. In Levinas's terms, the other is being reduced to the same. Levinas believes this same impulse of reducing and totalizing is, this, is that the same impulse as characterizing those who practice violence and war, to subjugate the other to oneself. And those who are not willing to be subjugated are killed or annihilated or marginalized or dismissed or called unreasonable. Of course, the violence is always justified. Some ultimate good is promoted and we fight in the name of freedom or rights or God. And of course, I think sometimes the fighting is justified. I happen to accept principles of just war that in case uh, there are occasions in the course of nations where war is right and inevitable, but rare. But overall, as humans, we seek to avoid war. We ought to seek to avoid war. But Levinas believes that the seeds of war are our commitments to reductivist and totalitarian thinking in which difference is erased and we seek like-mindedness. That's the seed of war. War is its fruition, its fulfillment. The Western philosophical tradition, according to Levinas, spreads these seeds of war. It believes that we are indeed always at war with one another. To quote uh, the British philosopher Thomas Hobbes, the human condition is, quote, the war of every man against every man. Therefore, the philosophy of argument coming from this tradition is going to be rooted in a view of warfare. So the question. Is argumentation a symptom or a cure of our totalitarian disease? Well, how do we define argumentation? Perlman, of course, defines it as seeking adherence. It is a mode of seeking agreement. Kenneth Burke speaks of rhetoric as promoting or push, pursuing identification and consubstantia consubstantiality. In other words, through argumentation, we promote it in the West because it seeks like-mindedness. It seeks turning heterogeneity into moments of homogeneity. It takes otherness and reduces it to the same. Even if the same is given a name, such as reason, we take the diversity of human opinions and beliefs and values and in the name of reason, we seek to homogenize, to agree. We reduce, we totalize. We submit our distinctive differences to an overarching and impersonal ruler, and we must rely on those priests of reason, that impersonal ruler, such as the philosophers and the logicians, to keep us in line. Uh, Maurice Natanson, who was uh, one of the significant philosophers of argument in the 1950s in the United States, described ethical argument, philosophical argument, his best view of argument. Here is his quote for the best view of argument. When an, he quote Maurice Natanson, when an argument hurts me or cuts me, 
or liberates me and cleanses me. It is not because a particular segment of my worldview is shaken up or jarred free, but because I am wounded or enlivened, I in my particularity. Again, did you hear the language? Argument is seen by Maurice Nathanson in describing the best sorts of philosophical argument. It is seen as a contest in which there is victory and defeat of either injury or liberation. What view of human existence is contained in this view of argument? So the question again is, I ask, is argumentation a symptom or a cure for our disease of war? Levinas believes that uh, there is a path beyond war. There is more to our humanity than what Hobbes says that we are constantly at war. There is more to our humanity than our interest in conquering or overcoming others, of converting others to the same. There is more to us than simply wanting people to think like we do. According to Levinas, within the very movement of one person to another, in communication, we see in that movement, in that approach, not a move of war, but a move of peace. When we approach another to speak or to greet or to ask, according to Levinas, we are drawing nigh to one's neighbor, drawing close to a neighbor. I love even the greeting, salon, right? Hello is peace. The first greeting is a move of peace. It's not a move of domination or subjugation. So Levinas' insight is in this approach, in the very move to greet, to say hello to another. We are not reducing or violating others. Instead, we are honoring and respecting the other at that very moment of approach. The other is more than I. The other is above and beyond. The other is worthy. And we are pulled to the other as an impulse of responsibility for the other to care and to assist. It's in that approach, drawing nigh to the neighbor, drawing close to the neighbor. But then, according to Levinas, we utter sentences. And what happens? We often turn that peaceful greeting into self-support, competi competitive interaction, reduction, evaluation, objectification. Thus, the content of what we say, the said, Levinas's term, reflects our warlike tendencies. Levinas urges, therefore, that we communicate with one another in a way that preserves the approach so that our content, the said, always has the traces, the, the presence of respect, honor, and care. He talks about that approach as the saying, the saying of the said. The saying, the articulation, the approach is the ethical movement of peace, and the content is that which tends to objectify. So how do we argue then? By preserve, preserving the approach, the greeting, the salom of honor and respect, the saying, how do we argue? Well, for that, I turn to fourth century, before the birth of Christ in Greece, uh, Isocrates, a Greek significant rhetorical figure who is often unknown by those around the world who study rhetoric. Why? Because uh, Isocrates was an intellectual rival of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And in the scope of history, Aristotle and Plato and Socrates have been more influential. So Isocrates is unknown. However, in the fourth century of Athens, Isocrates had the most successful educational system for the study of rhetoric. But Isocrates is also unknown because he did not leave us a theory or philosophy of rhetoric. I, we only know about Isocrates' theory of rhetoric through his practice of rhetoric. Right? Isocrates gave speeches, and we can learn from his speeches what a more peaceful rhetoric might be. 
The key to Isocrates is recognizing that he left no theory. He had no grand design of rhetoric precisely because he was opposed to the sort of philosophical work of Plato. Isocrates believed that the best intellectual work is rooted in the specific arguments of communities. So Isocrates committed his rhetoric to the practice, to the performance of arguments on and behalf of and within Athens, Greece, um, surround, and the surrounding areas. In other words, he was local, he was regional, he didn't generalize rhetoric, he performed it. He, does, he avoided the philosophical desire to unify knowledge. Well, what can we learn from his practice then of rhetoric? I can just do this very quickly. It requires uh, further elaboration of research, but let me highlight uh, rhetoric, or Isocrates' practice of rhetoric. For Isocrates, argumentation must be timely. That is, any time you want to persuade for effectiveness, you must adapt to the specific moment of the individuals and the contexts. Clear. Isocrates understood that deeply. If you're going to achieve any agreement at all, you must fit your discourse deeply into the very specific moment of the utterance. It is timely. If your argumentation doesn't take into account the specifics of the context or the situation, then it will miss its mark. People will not be persuaded. In other words, you must, as an orator, as a persuader, as an arguer, you must seize the moment. I believe the phrase in Arabic is uh, ikhtanam al-fursa. Ikhtanam close? Ikhtanam al-fursa. Seizing the moment. The time is right, ripe. The time is now. Uh, and we, we've heard that at this conference. Now is the time. This is a ripe, this is the opportune moment to seize for Qatar debate uh, and linking English and Arabic worlds in our debate and organization, right? So to be persuasive, you must be sensitive to the moment in which you are speaking. For Isocrates, this is not merely a strategic moment, but it is an ethical moment. It is a moment in which you participate in the good. Right? How do you argue in a timely way that is good? I describe his mode of argument as attentiveness. That is, it's giving attention to. So Isocratean attentiveness has two features. First, timely argument acknowledges. Timely argument acknowledges, which means that timely argument, the speaker is receptive to the voices of all, past and present. Isocrates, because the moment is always, finds itself within a situation, a context, a history, a memory, a past, Isocrates would always make reference to the past in commenting on the future. So his argumentation would link. He would work analogically, finding analogs in past experiences and in current other voices. He took into consideration the full range of concerns and possibilities and objections in his discourse. Secondly, I'll just go two more minutes and then. Secondly, timely argument is fertile. Very difficult concept. I don't know what word best to use here. It's fruitful. It gives birth. It's generative. It's additive. As fertile, it productive. In other words, timely argument adds to the resources of ideas and thoughts within your culture. Timely argument promotes history. It promotes memory. It promotes the fair and just consideration of all of the factors within the moment. And it also promotes the wise anticipation of the future. Why? Because it acknowledges and it is generative. You argue in such a way that you enable further moments for argumentation. You must per perpetuate the opportune moment. So argumentation does not eliminate, but it adds to. With Isocrates, argument never comes to a full stop. It's never a total victory. It always preserves the otherness of persons 
because time moves on. New opportunities always arise for argumentation, and we must acknowledge all the factors that constitute that new opportunity. Right. So if argumentation and debate is the hope for the future world, we must think of argumentation debate not with the resources of the Western philosophical tradition, which are rooted in concepts of totality and subjugation and hegemony. Instead, we think of the resources I suggest with Isocrates' concept of timeliness, in which through attentiveness, we build into and add to the resources of ongoing argumentative cultures. Thank you. Shokra. Yes, please. So thank you very much for your marvelous presentation. I'm very happy that I uh, listened to something which go ab uh, above uh, uh, farther than only uh, to the battle of the arguments in the thank strictly uh, uh, logical sense and in the strict framework of policies, on etc. And you. I would like to to ask you how you see the relation between dialectic and dialogical approach to communication yeah. and to your framework. Yes. Um, for, you. yes, uh, Isocrates yes. Would, would understand that uh, dialectic process. Uh, well, he was, he was not um, fond of it, okay? Because, let's, to the, Dialectic is guided by the idea of reasonableness, being reasonable. For Isocrates, being reasonable is an effect or an outcome of his rhetorical practice. It is, it is, a, it is a matter of ethos. So you, you construct and develop what counts as reason within your culture through your timely argumentation. So reason, the concept of reason or dialectic, does not determine or shape or constrain or control your argument. Rather, your argument helps shape and control and constrain what counts as reason within your interaction with others. So in that sense, the concept of reason and what it is to be reasonable is always up for grabs. It's part of what we argue about. So the concept of reason is not a tool to discipline argument. It's one of the topics that we should argue about across cultures. And we may disagree, right? Okay, okay thank you f uh, very much for the inspiring presentation. I really like it. It touches on our hearts and our feeling. And the reason why I'm saying this, because I lived in the West for about seven years. Okay. And all the time that I speak to somebody, he always have the feeling that he's the reference. I mean, he's the reference in his way of life, in his way, in the way how he do his business, the way how he interacts with colleagues and so on. And when we argue, you know, and we come across something that is, uh, I would say, in agreement with the way he lives and the way he thinks, he becomes heavy. You know, it and when it's happy, happy yeah. uh, and he smiles and things like that, and when when it's the opposite, then he tries to argue. Yeah, it's not like that. You don't try. You need to, to, to change and things like that. So, do you think that this is really a, a reflection of the structure of power that is uh, that is going on? So, the, the this feeling of superiority of the West is what gives them that their arguments. Is uh, should be uh, should be should be better should be applied and so on and the others no, no. especially in the Middle East are still have long way to go before they 
uh, fit to the to the uh, to the I would call it the Western reference. Yeah. Are you asking if if there is a, a culture of superiority as part in the Western tradition? Such and this that, is that the reflection of the power structure because they have the power now. They have they think that they are happier. Uh, um, they're the, they are rich. Yeah. Yeah. My argument. Yes. I wasn't making. Uh, uh, that may be true, but that, that's, that's not what I, I'm trying to say here, is it's not that the argument is embedded in political or military structures of power, and that is the danger. It's that the, f the philosophical framework that the West uses in argument, that is the, that, according to Mer Emmanuel Levinas, is dangerous. So now there might be an, a, a consonance, there might be some interaction between the political and military structures of power and the way the West understands reason, I, but I'm not making that association. That would, that's an interesting question. But this is not only on the political level. You even feel it at the individual level. So when you argue with somebody, you have the feeling that he's, he's a reference. I mean, this is something I feel. Yeah, yeah, yes, we 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 argue to win, uh, and and that's okay. I mean, we need that's good, and we're because we should we're right. We should be persuasive. That's a good thing, and that's honoring and respecting. Uh, we all should do that. But but the danger is we we use our victory then to marginalize or dismiss or harm or neglect others. So the focus is more on our self-achievement as arguers rather than our care and concern for others. So argument should be a way of extending grace and favor and mercy to others and care for others, not a way of itemizing, objectivizing, and dominating. So that's, I don't know if I'm getting, thank you. Yes. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm Juha Reike from Finland. So uh, you just gave us uh, uh, some sort of a meta-analysis of argumentation. Yes. Uh, would you say that this uh, requirement of timeless, timeliness yes. concerns also this kind of meta-analysis? Because it came to my mind that perhaps Levinas is sharing the view he is criticizing, namely the view that people should agree with him. Yeah, oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, Levinas is is very sophisticated philosopher. Levinas actually has a philosophical style of writing that makes it very hard to understand him, which is probably part of the strategy that he uses because he knows there is uh, th that within the realm of the said, the content, there is always violence. So therefore, he is writing very metaphorically. I would call it philosophical poetry because he is trying to encourage us to recognize the moments of peace. And it's hard to do that while describing them. I have then been very violent in my description of Levinas today. But it's a necessary violence, he would say. So yes, even this meta-analysis, um, we are always risking and that's why we must try to speak uh, in timely ways so to open up opportunities for further engagement. Thank you. Okay, we've got our last question. Yeah. Uh, really enjoyed your... Afterwards, we can... I want to hear... Thank you. Um, generally, very sympathetic with your project. Uh, enjoyed your presentation, but I spot a major aporia that complicates your treatment of Isocrates. Let me quote. Uh, maybe from we don't <coughs> have time for your no, comment. No, it's just. I'll just. I just want to read one quote. Yes, one please. From. Uh, from Isocrates. Go ahead. Panagericus 15. Yes. We must compose our enmities against each other and turn against the barbarian, mm -hmm. rehearsing the misfortunes which have come upon us 
from our mutual warfare and the advantages which will result from a campaign against our natural enemy, these men do not speak the truth, but they do not start at the point from which they could best bring these things to pass. Yes, I it saw is, Hold on, let me finish this one. Go, go ahead, please. It's, it is enough of an aporia for your approach that he is labeling anyone uh, a barbarian right. who right. is not able to reason. Further complicating matters, though, yeah. is the barbarians were the Persians occupying what is now the Middle East. Yes. Um, I, I, I am reconstructing um, parts of, of, of Isocrates' practice, and I am doing it very charitably. I'm looking for the best in that man. He was very much a product of his culture. Uh, however, within his culture, and this is where I'd push back a little bit, his view of the barbarians and his view of Athenian military victory were actually very different than many of his uh, fellow Athenians. He actually ha was relatively generous towards the Persians in his attitudes toward them, relatively speaking. Timely argument is linked within specific cultures, and consequently, there will be much we disagree with. I would use Isocrates' own practice to critique his own views. So I think critiquing Isocrates' imperialist attitudes or bar attitudes for barbarians by a timeliness, I think he would have to change his views. So I am using his theory to generate a critique that I would use against him as well. Thank you. Let us thank Kenneth Chase, and I'm sure we'll all want to speak with him more afterwards.